In this latter respect, I was forced to take Talbot's advice, for he remained obstinately deaf to every further question or suggestion, and occupied himself exclusively for the rest of the evening with what was transacting upon the stage. In the meantime, I kept my eyes riveted on Madame Hollande, and at length had the good fortune to obtain a full front view of her face. It was exquisitely lovely, this, of course, my heart had told me before, even had not Talbot fully satisfied me upon the point, but still the unintelligible something disturbed me. I was finally concluded that my senses were impressed by a certain air of gravity, sadness, or still more properly of weariness, which took something from the youth and freshness in the countenance, only to endow it with a seraphic tenderness and majesty, and thus, of course, to my enthusiastic and romantic temperament with an interest tenfold. While well, I thus feasted my eyes, I perceived at length, at last, to my great trepidation, my almost imperceptible start on the part of the lady that she had become suddenly aware of the intensity of my gaze. Still, I was absolutely fascinated. I could not draw, draw, withdraw from it, even for an instant. She turned outside her face, and again I only saw the chiseled contour of the back portion of the head. After some minutes, after, as if urged by curiosity to see what if I was still looking, she gradually brought her face again around and again and countered my burning gaze. Her large dark eyes fell instantly, and a deep blush mantled her cheek. But what was my astonishment in perceiving that she then not only did a second time advert her head, but that she actually took from her girdle a double eyeglass, elevated it, adjusted it, and then regarded me through it intently and deliberately for the space of several minutes. Uh, had a thunderbolt fallen at my feet, I could not have been more thoroughly astounded. Astounded only, not offended, not or disgusted in the slightest degree, although an action so bold any other woman would have been likely to offend or disgust. But the whole thing was done with so much quietude, so much nonchalance, so much repose, with so evident an air of the highest breeding, in short, that nothing of mere effrontery was perceptible, and my sole sentiments were those of admiration and surprise. I observed that upon her first elevation of the glass, she seemed satisfied with the momentary inspection of my person, and was withdrawing the instrument, when, as if struck with it by a second thought, she resumed it, and so continued to regard me with fixed attention for the space of several minutes. For five minutes, at least, at the very least, I am sure. This action, so remarkable in an American theater, attracted very general attention and gave rise to an indefinite movement, or buzz, among the audience, which for a moment filled me with confusion but produced no visible effect upon the countenance of Madame Melande. Having satisfied her curiosity, if such it was, she dropped the glass and quietly gave her attention again to the stage, her profile now being turned toward myself as before. I continued to watch her unremittingly, although I was fully conscious of my rudeness in so doing. Presently, I saw the head slowly and slightly change its position, and soon I became convinced that the lady, while pretending to look at the stage, was, in fact, attentively regarding myself. It is needless to say what effect this conduct on the part of so fascinating a woman had upon my excitable mind. Having thus scrutinized me for perhaps quite a quarter of an hour, the fair object of my passion addressed that gentleman who attended her, and while she spoke I saw distinctly by the glances of both that the conversation had reference to myself. Upon its conclusion, Madame Lande again turned toward the stage, and for a few minutes 
seemed absorbed in the performances. At the expiration of this period, however, I was thrown into extremity of agitation by seeing her unfold for the second time, the eyeglass which hung by her at her side. Fully confronting me as before and disregarding the renewed buzz of the audience, surveying me from head to foot with the same miraculous composure which had previously so delighted and confounded my soul. This extraordinary behavior by throwing me into a perfect fever of excitement, into an absolute delirium of love, served rather to embolden than this, to di disconcert me. In the mad intensity of my devotion, I forgot everything but the presence of the ma majestic loveliness of the vision which confronted my gaze. Watching my opportunity, when I thought the audience was fully engaged with the opera, I at length caught the eyes of Madame Lalande, and upon the instant made a slight but unmistakable bow. She blushed. Very deeply, then averted her eyes, then slowly and cautiously looked around, apparently to see if my rash action had been noticed, then leaned over to, toward the gentleman who sat by her side. I now fen felt a burning sense of the impropriety I had committed, and expected nothing less than its instant exposure. While a vision of pistols upon the moral floated rapidly and uncomfortably in, through my brain. I was greatly and immediately relieved, however, when the, I saw the lady merely hand the gentleman a playbill without speaking, but the reader may form some feeble conception of my astonishment, of my profound amazement, my delirious bewilderment of heart and soul. When after, instantly afterward, having again glanced furtively around, she allowed her bright eyes to set fully and steadily upon my own, and then with a faint smile disclosing a bright line of her pearly teeth, made two distinct, pointed, and unequal vocal affirmations, affirmative inclinations upon the head, of my head. It is useless, of course, to dwell upon my joy, upon my transport, upon my illimitable ecstasy of heart. If ever a man was sad with ex excess of happiness, it was myself at that moment, I loved. This was my first love, so I felt it to be. It was my, it was love supreme, indescribable. It was love at first sight. And at first sight, too, it had been appreciated and returned. Yes, returned. How and why should I doubt them for an instant? What other could construction could I possibly put upon such conduct on the part of a lady so beautiful, so wealthy, so evidently so accomplished, of so high breeding, of so lofty a position in society, in every regard so entirely respectable as I felt assured was Madame Lalande. Yes, she loved me. She returned the enthusiasm I love, with an enthusiasm so blind, as un uncompromising, as uncalculating, as abandoned, and as utterly unbounded as my own. These delicious fancies and reflections, however, were now interrupted by the falling of a drop curtain. The audience arose, and the usual tumult immediately supervened. Quitting Talbot abruptly, I made every effort to force my way closer, into closer proximity with Madame Lalande. Having failed in this on account of the crowd, I at length gave up the chase and bent my steps homeward, consoling myself for the, my disappointment in not having been able to touch even the hem of her robe by the reflection that I should be int introduced by Talbot in due form upon the morrow. This morrow at last came, that is to say, a day finally dawned upon the long and weary night of impatience. And the hours until one were snail-paced, dreary, and innumerable. But even Stamboul, it is said, shall have an end, and there came an end to this long delay. The clock struck.
as the last echo ceased, I stepped into bees and inquired for Talbot. Out, said the footman, Talbot's home. Out, I replied, staggering back half a dozen paces. Let me tell you, my fine fellow, that this thing is thoroughly impossible and impracticable. Mr. Talbot is not out. What do you mean? Nothing, sir. Only Mr. Talbot is not in. That's all. He rode over immediately after breakfast and left word that he should not be in town again for a week. I stood petrified with horror and rage. I endeavored to reply, but my tongue refused its office. At length, I turned on my heel, livid with wrath, and inwardly consigned the whole tribe of the Talbots to the innermost regions of Erebus. It was evident to my, that my considerate friend, Il Fanatico, had quite forgotten his appointment with myself, had forgotten it as soon as it was made. At no time was he a very scrupulous man of his word. There was no help for it, so smothering my vexation as well as I could, I strolled moodily up the street, propounding futile, futile inquiries about Madame Lalande to every male acquaintance I met. By report, she was known, I found to all, by too many by sight, but she had been in town for only for a few weeks. And there were a few, if there were four, who claimed her personal acquaintance. These few, being compared, still comparatively strangers, could not or would not take the liberty of introducing me through the formality of a morning call. While I stood thus in despair, conversing with a trio of friends upon the all-absorbing subject in my heart, it so happened that the subject itself passed by. As I live, there she is, cried one. Surprisingly beautiful, exclaimed a second. An angel upon earth, ejaculated a third. I looked in an open carriage which approached us. Passing slowly down the street, sat the enchanting vision of the opera, and accompanied by the younger lady who had occupied a portion of her box. Her companion also wears more remarkably well, said one of the material who had spoken first. Astonishingly, said the second. Still a quite brilliant air, but art will do wonders. Upon my word, she looks better than she did in Paris five years ago. A beautiful woman still. Don't you think so, Frost Art? Uh, Simpson, I mean. Still, said I, and why shouldn't she be? But compared with her friend, she is as a rush light to the evening star, a glowworm to Antares. Ha, ha, ha. Why, Simpson, you have an astonishing tact at making discoveries. Original ones, I mean. And here we separated, while one of the trio began humming a gay vaudeville, of which I caught, only caught the lines, Ninon, 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 Abba, Abba, Ninon, to lend close. During this scene, little scene, however, one thing had served greatly to console me, although it fed the passion by which I was con consumed. As the carriage of Madame Lalande rolled by our group, I had observed that she had recognized me, and more than this, she had blessed me by the most seraphic of all imaginable smiles, with no equal vocal mark of the recognition. As for that introduction, I was obliged to abandon all hope of it until such time as Talbot should think proper to return to the from the country. In the meantime, I perseveringly frequented every repeatable place of public amusement, and at length at the theater, when I first saw her, I had the supreme bliss of meeting her and of exchanging glances with her once again. This did not occur, however, until the lapse of a fortnight. Every day in the interim, I had inquired for Talbot at this hotel, and every day had been thrown into a spasm of wrath by the everlasting, not come home yet. I was footman. Upon the evening in question, therefore, I was in condition of a little short of madness. Madame Lalande, I had been told, was a Parisian, and had come had lately arrived from Paris. Might she not suddenly return? Return before Talbot came back? 
and might not she be thus lost to me forever? The thought was too terrible to bear. Since my future happiness was the issue, I resolved to act with amendment decision. In a word, upon the breaking up of the play, I traced the lady to her residence, noted the address, and the next morning sent her a full and elaborate letter into which I poured my, out my whole heart.